Psalm 26. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house in the place where your glory dwells. Do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed, in whose hands is a wicked scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me, and be gracious to me. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations I shall bless the Lord." In this psalm, David appears to bring a plea before the holy judge of heaven. It appears that he was suffering from some sort of unjust abuse. David, as I'm sure all of us at some point in time in this fallen world, uh, was the subject of lying propaganda and some sort of malicious gossip. David provides us here in this psalm with a great example of what we're to do in such cases. How are the children of God to handle accusations and um, lies that are said about us? Well, it seems that David's uh, course was to uh, bring his case before the high king of heaven, to plea his case before his judgment seat. If the statements being made are really wrong, then we can be sure that our God will straighten things out in his timetable according to his plan. Now, there will be some falsehoods that may persist in this life, but for sure we know one day all wrongs will be righted. The sovereign ruler of the universe will bring all evildoers to judgment. So rather than sinking to the level of our enemies and engaging in retaliation, if you have walked in integrity, you can bring your complaint before God's judgment seat and leave the matter with Him. Leave room for the wrath of God. Can we not trust God? our God, to guard our reputation and to protect our integrity? David certainly did. Notice three movements in this song for exoneration. First of all, I want you to note with me, number one, a call for examination and vindication. A call for examination and vindication. David begins in verses one and two by asking the Lord to examine him and vindicate him from the slanders that he was receiving. He could do this because David had a clear conscience in the matter because he had walked in integrity. Notice that he does not ask for the Lord to just give a cursory judgment regarding this or, or one that's even partial towards David's cause. Um, he asks that even the Lord test his mind and his heart. David declares that it's not only um, that he hadn't sinned outwardly regarding these matters, but he hadn't even sinned inwardly. He had been upright in mind and heart regarding these things. Spurgeon remarks, Worried and worn out by the injustice of men, the innocent spirit flies from its false accusers to the throne of eternal right. He had need have a clear case who dares to carry his suit before the king's bench of heaven. What a comfort it is to have the approval of one's own conscience. If there be peace within the soul, the blustering storms of slander which howl around us are of little consideration. When the little bird in my bosom sings a merry song, it is no matter to me if a thousand owls hoot at me from without. You see, David was able to have this position because he had a clear conscience. His, his life was upright, and so he was able to bring these matters to the Lord, asking for him to deal with it in his, in his own way. Now, how did he have this position? Look at verse 3. Because your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. God's loving kindness was before uh, David's eyes, and he had walked in his truth. Note the words love and truth. God's love and truth had guided David, and so therefore he knew he was innocent in the matters that were before him. This brings us to a second thing. He had a proven track record of abhorring evil and clinging to good. Abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good. To further his case, David explains how he had conducted his life. 
He declares what he hates in verse 5, the assembly of the evildoers. He avoided the assembly of the evildoers. And then he says in verse 8 what he loves. He loved the habitation of the Lord's house and the place where God's glory dwelled. Spurgeon said, A man is known by his company, and if we have kept ourselves apart from the wicked, it will always be evidence in our favor should our character be impugned. He who is never in the parish is not likely to have stolen the corn. He who is never out at sea is clearly not the man who scuttled the ship. A man who does not hate evil terribly must not love good heartily. Men as men we always must are called to love, but evildoers as such are traitors of the great king, and, they are, and no loyal subject of the great king can love an absolute traitor. What God hates, we must hate. Better to sit with the blind and the halt and the lame at the table of mercy than with the wicked in their feasts of ungodliness. It's better to sit on Job's dunghill, Spurgeon says, than on Pharaoh's throne. Let each reader see well to his company, for such as we keep in this world, we are likely to keep in the next. Romans 12, 9 says the same thing. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. When love is true, when love is sincere, we must hate what is evil and love what is good. And then David declares, even in the midst of his cry for vindication, that the slanderers of, uh, the, slanders of the evil doers are not going to prevent him from worship. We're told in verses 6 and 7, I shall wash my hands in innocence. I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. Spurgeon remarks, To sound abroad the worthy praises of the God of all grace should be the everyday business of a pardoned sinner. Let men slander us as they will. Let us not, though, defraud the Lord of his praises. Let the dogs bark... But let us, like the moon, shine on. God's people should not be tongue-tied. The wonders of divine grace are enough to make the tongue of the dumb sing. God's works of love are wonders if we consider the unworthiness of the objects, the costliness of the method, and the glory of this result. And as men find great pleasure in discoursing upon things remarkable and astonishing, so the saints rejoice to tell of the great things which the Lord has done for them. Into the abodes of sin, uh, David would not enter. But where he longed to be was in the house of the Lord. We were, would be sad children if we didn't love where our Father dwelled. Now, there's a wonderful thing to know here in the New Covenant that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And yet there is something singularly special and unique when the church gathers together. Certainly this is among one of the things that we miss right now, right? Maybe we even feel these words all the more strongly in verse 8. How I love the habitation of your house, the place where your glory dwells. We know that the Lord's glory dwells within his church and that certainly we are the temple uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, but there's something unique and wonderful when we gather together, as we assemble together as the joined people of God to sing God's praises, to attend to his word, to learn and study, to come to places of repentance and renewal and thanksgiving and worship. And I know that we all love this time together, and so we're missing it right now and looking forward to the day when the Lord uh, should allow us to gather together again. We then see, thirdly, the, a prayer for perseverance by preservation. A prayer for perseverance by preservation. It, we who cherish the doctrines of grace remember TULIP as an acronym, a way to remember summarizing what grace means, that God saves us while we were totally depraved or radically depraved by unconditional election through a limited atonement or particular redemption, via irresistible or effectual grace, by which he causes us to persevere to the end. It is true to say that we are both preserved by grace and persevere by grace. We persevere because God preserves us, and the preserving work of God shows itself in our perseverance. These ideas come together in David's final words. David prays that the Lord will not allow his fate to be the same as the wicked, he asks the Lord to preserve him in the midst of all that's going on. And then David declares that what he had done in the past, we see in verse 1, that he had walked in integrity, trusting the Lord. He, asks, he now says, I'm committed to doing the same in the future, verse 11. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. And yet look at the second part of verse 11, where in which he says, redeem me and be gracious to me. 
So he says, I've walked in integrity. I'm going to continue to walk in integrity. But yet he says, redeem me and be gracious to me. Spurgeon says, trusting in God, the psalmist resolves that the plain way of righteousness self shall be his choice. Yet he is by no means a boaster or a, of a self-righteousness um, or of his own strength. He cries for redemption and pleads for mercy. Because our integrity is not absolute nor inherent. It is the work of grace in us. And it's marred by human infirmity. So therefore, we must resort to the redeeming blood um, and to the throne of mercy. Confessing that though we are saints among men, we are still sinners before God. And David could then stand on a level place. Verse 12, my foot stands on a level place because God had redeemed him, redeemed him and had been gracious to him. And that redemption and grace was evident then in his upright living for God's glory, the integrity with which David carried himself. This psalm ends in verse 12, the second part, in the congregations I shall bless the Lord. Spurgeon provides us with a fitting conclusion. The song began in the minor, but has now reached the major key. Saints often sing themselves into happiness. Established in Christ Jesus, by being vitally united to him, we have nothing left to occupy our thoughts but praises of our God. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And when assembled, let us not be slow to contribute our portion of thanksgiving. Each saint is a witness to divine faithfulness and should be ready with his testimony. As for the slanderers, let them howl outside the door while the children sing within. Dear church family, during this time of social distancing and as we long for the moment in which we can assemble together once again, let's not... Um, Let's not neglect to spend time worshiping the Lord right where we are. Practice with all of your heart so when we gather back together, we can lift our voices in song together, blessing the Lord even in the midst of slanderers and difficult times.